luxury tech redefined. The new Range Rover exclusively here on Tech Today. An iPhone 14 made in India edition that's not going to be a pipe dream it seems. And an exclusive ground report from the semiconductor industry in Taiwan. I'm your host Ayush Alavadi. Stay tuned for the latest from the world of technology on Tech Today. Well, you can see that 32 teeth smile. That's what a tech geek is all about when you come out of the new Range Rover autobiography. Yes, it's a monster. It's a premium SUV. It looks good. This is the first look and exclusive reveal on Tech Today. But there's so much that's changed in this one from the previous generation. We've been waiting for a few years in terms of tech and design. And hence, we have it with us on Tech Today. Let me take you to the front first. Start off with this grill. And you see this is proprietary, very different from previous Range Rovers. It's not some design or just some random animation or something like that. It is really well cut mesh, which makes it look really muscular. And if you're taking it out for a camping trip with your family, well, there's so much more that you can do in this Range Rover right here in the back. There you see it pops up over there. This obviously comes with the vehicle. And then there is all sorts of interesting things that you can do whilst you're seated here. I'm guessing someone my size, my height is quite comfortable. You can have a companion here as well. Well, of course, once you turn the entertainment suite on and you're sitting with your significant other, enjoying the stars up over there, if it's not the panoramic sunroof, you also have a really cool option over here. You lift this up. And once it's locked into place and you lean back, this is your lazy boy experience, even here on a camping site. So I think this gives it a very interesting well, rear experience, well then you can't be cribbing about boot space when this is nearly 2000 litres, like a pickup truck. I think this is Isuzu levels over there. And also, this guy can also go off-roading, but with a lot of tech in the back seat and the front seat. That's what I'm going to show you next once we've closed this already. So let's explain what's happening here on this touchscreen system over here at the back. While I'm doing all of this, I want to take a nice massage. So there's all sorts of options, right? Wave, Pulse, Pulse Duo, Hot Stones, Rolling, Up, Down, Lower, Back. And boy, the minute it comes on, this is heaven. I could wrap up with a Tech Today shoot and be sat here in the back. When you click on the rear screen option, you have these screens on each side for the driver, which can be connected to HDMI 1, HDMI 2, and then you can have a Fire Stick, put on some other sort of device which you want to watch, increase the brightness, reduce the brightness. But then you'll say, okay, what if passenger number one wants to use this device for some content and passenger number two wants to use something else? Then Range Rover's done a good job with the business class experience with these proprietary headphones. They're wired, of course, but these headphones will be in the door on either side, put them on and then this passenger can watch different content from this passenger and not disturb the driver. But I really can't see myself sitting in the back seat too long because the real magic in this car happens in the front seat if you want to drive it yourself. Let's go to the front seat now. I'm smiling because it's not about, well, driver modes and seat modes. That's all there. But the handles actually pop out to greet you when you are getting closer to the car. And I think that is quite a sweet little trick and a Nice welcome when you're getting to your Range Rover. Look, we've had Mercedes, BMWs, Audis on the show, and they all have very different sorts of approaches to design. The Mercedes and especially the BMW electric have this long panel running across, curved on the sides, very futuristic. But what if you wanted to balance modernity and class and tradition and heritage? That's what this new Range Rover is doing. They've kept the leather where it's needed, they've kept these fancy buttons where needed, and then two touch screens. When we're talking about this main touch screen infotainment system, they call this entire software experience PV Pro. This is proprietary Range Rover. And look, it's not fancy like a Tesla because a Tesla is more of a software tech company than I think an automotive company, while the driving experience is great. You look at this screen and it's very intuitive. The user experience is smooth. 
it's tactile, the buttons respond really well, you have all sorts of features over here. But things that I find fascinating are right over here in dynamic I for once. You can change the engine steering, gear shift, suspension to dynamic, to comfort and then there's the G meter. Now what is the G meter all about? The car's in P so we're safe. I press the brake, the amount that I am pressing the brake with all the gravity statistics is right here. Even if you press the throttle a little bit, there you see. Over here is where you can genuinely understand that the Range Rover is a 4x4, is an off-roader if you want it to be. The vehicle is set in access height. What that essentially means is there are three modes. There is access height, the vehicle with an air suspension lowers down to a point where you can access it easily. You can sit in the rear seat with your significant other or even if you're traveling with your pet, you can also then move into normal mode. It comes up by a few millimeters and then when you take it to off-roading mode is where all the magic happens. Right now, as you can see, it is at 0.77 meters. I'll tell you why weight sensing in this particular menu becomes interesting because in the three modes that I was telling you about, you can tell where this vehicle can wade through water. And yes, at this point currently, the vehicle can go in water up to that height. If I click on this button over here, this is something that I find really cool because the minute you want to go into normal, the car is going to be moving up a little bit. And I'll tell you how it changes the, the weight sensing altogether. Right now, it's going to take a while, but you click on off-road and the car has now moved much, much higher. I can feel it whilst I'm sat over here. The car is getting elevated first from the back and now from the front. Now this car has a far more commanding presence and you're high up over there. That also means better off-roading capabilities. And imagine what it means for waterlogged streets all over India, especially from June to September. That's why this becomes a lot more interesting. You can obviously look at all of these functions like dynamic stability control and stuff like that. But now if we go back to the weight sensing place, now you can see that this car can be in water all the way up to nearly 0.9 meters and believe you me that is nearly three feet right so you're high up over there in water and this car is continuing to drive now this is something that i want to talk about post covid and during the pandemic a lot of us have been worried about air quality i'm sat here inside the range rover showroom and even then if you look at this particular display it's 15 pm 2.5 on the outside and because the car's been open for so long it is on seven on the inside. That's not very good. It's getting more polluted on the outside. So if I just want to switch on, it's obviously purification, then, you know, there's carbon dioxide reduction and then ionization. This is a proper purification system. You can already see how the interior number has come down to five. It'll be down to one if we stay in a closed cabin for longer. Let's click on the cameras. Now, this doesn't look like one of those Chinese vehicles. This is pure class. In the showroom, you can see exactly whichever part of the car you want to, a good 3D representation. You can also see everyone else around here with all the cameras around the car. There's also small features and this detail paid to privacy and security. Something as simple as these buttons. You press them and you have a glove box here and you can close it. You press this, you have a glove box here. Now you'll ask me, why do you need buttons for this? That's because the minute you enter valet mode over here, enter your pin, this gets locked and these guys get locked. So it's a little bit like a safety locker for you. So obviously you have a little bit of storage over here and you can place stuff. But this is not where we are looking. Where we want to give you a sneak peek is over here in the front. Slide this wooden panel to the front. There's a little bit of storage. You have a USB-C type charging facility here. And then, a little inconvenient, but you can place your phone all the way over here for wireless charging. Honestly, this is something that I wasn't very impressed with. In terms of placement, it's a little difficult. As you can see, it's not the most convenient placement in such a big cabin. Maybe this could have been over here, but I'm not nitpicking. You win some, you lose some. To cover up for that awkward placement of the phone and the fact that it's gonna to be tough dealing with bigger phones like the iPhone 13 Pro Max or the S22 Ultra, the cool thing about that is that Range Rover claims that they've put signal boosters out there. So if you're worried about your phone being in the dark abyss, maybe you'll get good network. Oh, something really cool that I wanted to show you as well was the rear view mirror with the cameras at the back. If there's a tall person sitting in the back, then you have these rear view mirrors which you can adjust 
with these cameras and I am fascinated by this. You can see everything happening behind you in crystal clear 4K quality. So the Range Rover Autobiography, exclusively a first look for you on tech today. Look, we've given you a tech geek's perspective, but there's a lot more when it comes to driving this car, which we'll also be getting you in an in-depth review on Business Today and India Today. So stay tuned. The technology world has just come out of a chip shortage and now we're talking about another chip shortage which might be on the cards because of the Taiwan crisis. So we thought we will get you a ground report from Taiwan from a semiconductor manufacturing unit, a chip manufacturing unit to actually tell you what the ground situation is all about. My colleague Gaurav Savant reporting exclusively from Taiwan. A semiconductor or a chip? Perhaps the most potent weapon in Taiwan's armory. More potent than the F-16 Vipers and the Patriot. And on this show, we will tell you how sand and rock, SiO2, are converted into polysilicon rocks and then a silicon ingot. How bare silicon wafers are made out of this and how this is then converted into this chip or IC that's used perhaps in most devices in your house from a mobile phone to a television set to a refrigerator or the aircraft you fly in by some accounts majority of such products come from Taiwan Gaurav Savant in one of the most secretive manufacturing plants in the world the center of technology which makes Taiwan one of the biggest soft powers in the world. This is Semiconductor Manufacturing Unit of Micronics International at the Senchu Science Park, 80 kilometers from Taipei in Taiwan. Taiwan manufactures over 90% of the most advanced varieties of semiconductor chips in the world. We know this is a high tech and which requires uh, not only the manpower, the, the mind, the brain, as well as the infrastructure. So, for example, uh, providing a stable supply of electrical powers, uh, water supply, and everything else. Okay. Other than that, I think the entire supply chain, so, uh, for example, the wafer production, the testing, the assembly, so all the supply chain, that's uh, is a lot of uh, uh, co coherence, cooperation in the industry. So in Taiwan, I think uh, it provides a very provident uh, environment to develop all this. More than 150,000 are employed at this plant. Just 10 miles from Taiwan Strait, where Chinese warships have their guns pointed towards the small island nation. While on the surface everything is calm, there is real fear here of the dragon's aggression. A feeling of nervousness which is spooking electronic majors all across the world. This has led to several countries including the US and India to try and shift manufacturing of semiconductors locally to break China's stranglehold around Taiwan. You can barely see this microchip but this powers perhaps your mobile phone. Microchips or semiconductors like these also power missiles in different countries. So whether it's your television set or your refrigerator set or the car in your house, semiconductors by some accounts, 90% are manufactured here in Taiwan. If tensions with China increase, the global supply chain will be adversely impacted. And that's the reason Taiwan is reaching out to democracies across the world. Unless there is a check on China's authoritarianism and expansionism, then global economy may just be adversely impacted. It's time to act now or it may just be too late. In the creator economy, they say one year on the internet or on social media is equal to maybe three or five years in the offline brick and mortar world. Technology can do some fascinating things and the growth rate is so rapid that you can't compare it to any traditional media, so to speak. How can India's digital transformation journey continue? What will India's technology story be all about in the next 25 years? How can you harness technology to unlock infinite 
possibilities. These were some of the topics that we discussed at the India at 100 Business Today event. And this is a stellar panel that I hosted. Have a sneak peek. So is Microsoft. And I think Microsoft has a very interesting interpretation of the metaverse. From what all of us on the media side really interpret is gaming. And you marry the two, Microsoft's vision with the Activision deal and Vision and Activision. And then you marry that with the Indian, burgeoning Indian gaming space. Is that a marriage that's waiting to happen, Mr. Maheshwari? I went back in history uh, and I said, when India was at 50, I was overjoyed because I got this device in my hand that I thought unlocked everything in the world for me, which was the mobile phone. It's the first mobile phone I ever got uh, in, at that point in time. And it completely changed my paradigm uh, of what work was. Uh, but I had never, uh, through all my prior life, uh, all my education, I never had that kind of a thing in right. my hand. So for me, uh, I'm not mobile native. I became very used to the mobile over the last uh, 25 years. Today, if you look at a generation today, they are AI native, artificial intelligence native. For them, it's very normal to, to expect that there will be a recommendation that will be given to you on what you should do or uh, what, you, what options you have. And uh, there is no fear of the unknown uh, in any form uh, that this generation has. And this generation is also gaming in the metaverses. Uh, that exist today. So if you really look at the metaverses that exist at scale today, they are in the gaming worlds and many a time uh, you'll in fact have a very different conversation with the parent as to they're in that metaverse, they're not in the real world. Uh, so so you got to, uh, to, to manage that too. Now that generation as they grow and they come to environments that we all were working through uh, over the last couple of years, they will become very much native metaverse. Uh, and, and therefore where you're going to see the maximum uh, infusion first of a 2D metaverse, two-dimensional, and then three-dimensional metaverse is in platforms like Teams, uh, wherein a lot of us are working uh, today. Uh, and, and then you're able to think about this whole concept of hybrid work. Yeah. Uh, and, and to simplify hybrid work, we, at times we think of hybrid only as presence. Are you present physically or virtually? And that's the only hybrid that we work with. But ask somebody in the tech industry, in the services uh, domain, they work 24 by 7. So there is also a hybrid of time, asynchronous or synchronous. Now you combine the time dimension with the physical dimension, that's where metaverse really plays. From the metaverse, Mr. Gurnani, we're going to come to the other M in the room. And that is something that has been trending all over social media and, of course, um, on our news channels, which happens to be moonlighting. Now, I know a lot of IT firms and tech companies have different uh, responses and reactions to it. What is your take? Where do you stand um, on the concept for our audience of a lot of tech workers who, post-pandemic, started taking up secondary jobs, uh, maybe traditionally at night, to earn a secondary source of income? Mr. Gurnani? I mean, I think your friends in Gujarat would say only their life has been legitimized. So... Uh, I mean, you meet anybody in Gujarat, he was always doing two jobs. So, uh, I mean, I don't Sometimes know. Sometimes two, two, three, four also. I mean, that I don't know. Uh, I know you are superhuman, but, uh, uh, you know, my views have been very simple on this. Uh, number one, I think many a times we overemphasize on no event. I don't think moonlighting is that rampant. There will always be a few cases. But I don't think it is that rampant because let's face it, uh, most of us have efficiency and productivity targets. And they're measurable. It is not that you just put it in, I mean, thanks to all the automation, artificial intelligence. I mean, you live in a world where a certain amount of discipline, time management exists. So as far as I am concerned, somebody meets the productivity and efficiency norms and if he wants to make an extra buck as long as he is not committing a fraud and he is not, you know, doing something which is against the values and the ethics of the company, I have no problem. Frankly, I am going to probably make it a policy. 
that if you want to do it, I mean, sure, but be open about it. Share with us. So the headline is, CP Gurnani is pro-hustle culture for millennials. I mean, the headline Ayush is, that if you are a millennial and if you can do two jobs, do you are a superhero. I think, I think, yeah. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> September is almost here and that means the iPhone is coming. A brand new iPhone 14, but we're not revealing anything about the iPhone 14 yet. We'll give you a little surprise next week. For now, what we can reveal based on a few reports accessed by Business Today and Tech Today is that there's going to be a strong Make in India connection with the iPhone 14. It looks like Apple is considering expanding its supply chain and looking beyond China and maybe looking at India as a key growth driver. Look, this dependence on China is something that the world is shifting away from and India and Make in India seem like an ideal destination for a lot of tech companies. Nabila brings you a Tech Today special report. Well, are your big news for Apple fans and tech geeks in India? Indeed, the tech giant now plans to begin manufacturing the iPhone 14 in India nearly two months after its initial release in China. This would really narrow the gap between the two countries considerably, but production won't really happen simultaneously in both countries as some may have expected. The company has been working with suppliers to ramp up manufacturing in India and shorten the lag in production of the new iPhone from the typical six to nine months for previous launches, according to people who are familiar with the matter told us. In fact, Apple, which long made most of its iPhones in China, is seeking alternatives now as Xi Jinping's administration clashes with the US government and imposes lockdowns across the country that have really disrupted economic activity. Reports suggest that the US-based company has been gradually ramping up production of iPhones in India. Apple has made a majority of their iPhones in China so long, but is now seeking an alternative non-Chinese production site as Chinese governments clash with the United States administration, along with numerous lockdowns across China that have really dampened economic activity. Of course, previous models of the iPhone have been manufactured in India since 2017, but it's always been several months after the global launch. Currently in India, its devices are manufactured by three contract manufacturers or partners, namely Foxconn, Wistron and Pegatron. These partners are part of the Indian government's production-linked incentive scheme for mobile manufacturing. In fact, they need to make products worth a minimum of 8,000 crore rupees each year to get these incentives. According to reports, the first iPhone 14S from India will be finished in October or November. It remains to be seen though if that could really translate to a Diwali surprise for Indian tech enthusiasts on October 24th. The iPhone 14 will in all likelihood launch at the big Apple event on September 7th. It will be interesting to see if at all India can capitalize on the shift of focus from mass manufacturing in China to make in India with the new launches and go on and close the production gap in the near future. But for now, if you really want a make in India phone, a made in India iPhone 14, then you'll have to wait for a couple of more months at least. Another action-packed week from the world of technology draws to a close. So does this action-packed episode of Tech Today. But we'll continue our coverage on the Business Today social handles. So stay tuned. Until next week, this is Ayusha Lavadi saying, Adios. If you like the video, do like, comment, share and subscribe.